There are a lot of companies that make a lot of fighting games, but no one has a fighter resume quite like Capcom's. Their library is filled with countless gems, so much so that Capcom thought it was time to release a fighting collection. In this lot, you have all 5 Darkstalker games, 4 more classic games, and one more that plays so strangely you'd almost think it wasn't a fighting game. Cyberbot. Cyberbots is a 2D fighter that stands out with its mecha aesthetic and focus on air combat, as well as taking a massively different approach to the fighting game genre. A game where you fight with giant mechs? I could get behind that. I mean, I watched Pacific Rim, I thought it was cool. If you're not familiar with the game, I don't blame you. The game had limited distribution in arcades outside of Japan, and if you weren't about that pirate life, then Capcom Fighting Collection is your most convenient way of playing it, nearly three decades after its release. The origins of Cyberbots is pretty interesting as well. The game is actually a spin-off of Armored Warriors, a beat em up where you pilot a giant mech and fight other giant mechs. Someone took a look at this game and thought, hey, let's make a fighting game out of this. And that's exactly what they did. By taking the mechs and slapping on a new coat of paint, Cyberbots was born. So let's boot this up, shall we? Right off the bat, you might recognize a certain character. Yes, I'm talking about Jin Saotome. That's right, your first experience with Cyberbots was most likely seeing Jin in Marvel vs. Capcom's 1 and 2. Should have been in Marvel 3, not gonna lie, but anyways, this is where he came from. But contrary to what you might think from seeing Jin fight, the well-designed characters you see here actually have no impact on the gameplay. The only difference between them is victory dialogue and that you follow their own story as you progress to arcade mode. You know that giant arm that Jin would fight with in the crossovers? As it turns out, Jin and the rest of them are pilots, and it's the giant mechs that do the heavy lifting, which is to be expected with the mecha theme that's going on. So how about we get to the real stars of the show? So you got a tank, big whoop, want to fight? This arm belongs to the Mech Bloodia, and is one of the four variant armors that you can choose from. This lineup comes straight from the mech selection in the original game. Additionally, each category comes with two custom built versions of the base mech, so I should mention that in the original game, parts would occasionally drop from defeated enemies and the player could pick these items up to replace existing parts of their mech to perform different moves. The three components you can replace are the arm, legs, and weapon. If you take this system and apply it twice to 40 in Cyberbots for example, then you have the playable max Killer Bee and Tarantula. Notice how the base is the same for all three, but the exchangeable pieces are all different. Think of it as how you would customize your vehicle in Mario Kart, but instead of vehicle parts, they're mecha parts. Now do the same process with the other three variant armors and you have a starting roster of 12 playable characters. There are only so many parts that you can randomly assign to the mechs before you start getting repeats, but thankfully Cyberbots took an effort to make the parts function differently. Swordsman and Vice here share the same treads even though they're from different VAs, but Swordsman's tread attacks hit only one time while Vice's are multi-hitting. These small changes end up impacting the overall playstyles in a drastic way, allowing for a unique roster to emerge. Also joining them are four playable boss mechas that you fight one after the other as you near the end of arcade mode, and like the VAs, these mechs were taken from the original game, such as Helion, a near end game boss, and Warlock, another boss that you encounter multiple times. And then you have Guides who is literally just a common grunt in Armored Warriors. I guess the dev team thought it was a more practical choice than the giant tank or a scorpion boss, but at least they managed to put in my favorite mech, otherwise known as Super 8. While she was merely the second boss in the original, Cyberboss takes full advantage of this uniquely designed mecha. This is among the best sprite work I've ever seen in a fighting game as there is just so much fluid movement going on in a lot of areas. And her animations are a goldmine for video editors like me. You see the spin attack? Nah, that's just a weed trimmer. The way their mid or jump looks? Seems like a graceful jellyfish to me. Oh, this axe that she brings out? Actually, she first used it when she traveled back to the past, saw Freezer running amok, and decided to cut his ass up. Okay, I'm having way too much fun. Point I'm trying to make is, Super 8 is a beautiful work of art in an already beautiful game. There's even little things here and there like all of the collateral damage in the background as you're knocking each other over in a match. It reminds you that, oh yeah, I'm using a weapon of mass destruction, of course it's not gonna be neat and tidy. The bosses are playable by entering a combination of inputs as you select the regular mech, bringing the roster to 16. But there exists one more mech that was only available in certain versions of Cyberbots. This mech is none other than Z Goki. And as you might guess, he plays a lot like Akuma would if he was a giant robot. That's 17 absolute units altogether. Now would be a good time to explain how these mechs do all the damage they do. Okay, well, wish you can open your eyes. Bachi Falls! Let me show you how the gun works. Ah! 
For this video, I'll be using the version used in CFC, which has some slight differences from others, but the core game plan stays intact. The game operates off of a four button system. There are two basic attacks that are officially known as attack one and attack two, but are more commonly called light and heavy attacks respectively. Your light attack is your more quicker option, while your heavies are slower but more damaging. And up close, pressing one of these buttons will grab your opponent. Your other type of offense is your weapon, which mostly utilizes these items I've mentioned earlier. These attacks are usually a mech's way to play a full screen game, and are always some sort of projectile. Could be missiles, electric mines, you name it. Weapon attacks have a cooldown meter that's visible on the top of your life bar. Once a weapon attack is inputted, your meter goes down about halfway and you won't be able to perform this attack again until the meter fully refills. Some mechs like Super 8 don't have this visual aid, so learning the timing is key. Oddly enough, these attacks don't cause any chip damage. Projectiles not doing chip. How about that? You know what does chip damage though? The special attacks. These input combinations are all mecha specific and offer more utility, ranging from from keep away options to combo extensions. The last form of offense comes through your power meter, which is gained by landing attacks on your opponent. Once this meter is full, you and your power bar starts flashing so crazy that I thought it'd be best to slow down this footage as to not give you guys and myself a seizure. Oh, how do you watch that? It's like barfing rainbows in my eyes. The power meter allows you to perform one of two attacks. The first being your Giga Crush. These are generally used as a reversal to get an opponent off of you. While the bosses have unique Giga Crushes, the mechs who shared the same VAs have the same Giga Crush animation but with minor differences in their gameplay properties. The second kind of attack is your Cyber EX and allows you to deal big damage if you score a hit. I should mention that there lies another method to building meter, which is through the Universal Supercharge. This allows you to continuously build meter like if you were a Dragon Ball character. Just be careful since you can't attack in this state and if you happen to get hit while charging, you lose an arm. You mean like this? Yeah, like that. Most of the mechs have an arm meter and this behaves similar to the sun mechanic in Street Fighter. Taking enough damage in a short amount of time makes your arm fall off and being attacked while supercharging has the same effect regardless of your arm health. In this state, any moves that utilize your arm cannot be performed and you can't throw or tech throws. This can be a huge detriment to your mech if their strongest tools are performed with their arm and you could just walk over to get it back but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that your opponent isn't gonna let that happen. If enough time passes, your arm will automatically fall back in place. This snowball effect type of mechanic is one of the many reasons why having good defense is critical, and no other mechanic is more versatile when it comes to defense and offense than the last button, boost. On the ground, boost allows you to dash back and forth very quickly and enables you to attack with one of two dash attacks. Boosting in the air is a different story however. There are three types of air boost among the roster. Jump, dash, and hover. These allow for some crazy movement options that can keep an opponent guessing. The VAs and bosses have different health bar designs and all have indicators for how much of your boost gauge is used before it has to automatically refill. Combining the air movement with the attacks and projectiles turns cyberbots into an aerial battle where the mechs are swaying back and forth to be in a favorable position. It is this type of game plan that makes anime type fighters seem linear in air movement by comparison. And unsurprisingly, there's a lot of depth present. Unlike the fighting games I've previously reviewed on this channel, cyberbots has a small but dedicated competitive scene that's taken the time to learn the ins and outs of many of the tricks you see here. I really like that the game allows for a lot of flexibility. It's an appropriate metaphor for how you must be in tune with the engine you're inhabiting. And if you're wondering what the meta is like, know that it's unanimously agreed that Warlock is busted. So much so that CFC has the option to restrict the character. This footage demonstrates Warlock's power better than I ever could. Notice how Warlock can effortlessly keep someone out with a single button and play a highly defensive runaway game. He can also summon a clone of himself at will that has no hurt box and the clones attacks don't have any pushback which means with a little bit of timing i can do this So yeah, he's not getting out of jail anytime soon. The game is relatively unexplored, but it's agreed that just about any mech is worth giving a shot. There are some clearly stronger mechs like Vice and his amazing command grab, and Super 8 has his infinite that's just two attacks back to back, so try not to get caught with this. Then at the bottom of the barrel is the common goon guides because of his short range and lack of weapon utility. But even he has stuff like good air movement and an infinite, so if the worst mech has stuff like this, it really speaks volumes on the game's balancing. One of those if everyone is broken, no one is types. The presentation and gameplay makes for a strange but fun fighting game, but I found that Cyberbots has an air of unpopularity surrounding it. This isn't a concrete way to measure game activity, but I noticed how the game in this collection has fewer high ranked players compared 
compared to something like Street Fighter or Darkstalkers, and I'm sure it was due to its past rarity, but another reason has been cited to be the game itself, how being this bizarre is both a blessing and a curse. Fundamentals that you require like footsies, anti-airs, and movement can carry on from one fighting game to another, but Cyber Boss's aerial focused combat is such uncharted territory that it can be hard to apply these techniques to, and it can be even harder to apply Cyber Boss techniques to other fighters since the game isn't played in a traditional manner. It doesn't help that air stalling is just as effective, if not more so than rushing down your opponent, and if there's one thing the common fighting game player dislikes, it's zoning and defensive play. Helion says, psh, I don't care, and can stay up in the air for a long time, and when he eventually comes down, he doesn't have to wait very long to start back up again. This level of stalling can leave a more traditional fighting game fan frustrated and lost. And yeah, you could go after them and engage in a cat and mouse game, but ultimately the style doesn't have broad appeal. But you know what? It doesn't really have to. It seems to me that Cyberboss intended to fulfill a certain niche, and that was to be a mecha fighter. From the complex mechanics to the detailed visuals to the explosive sound design, it helps convey a good example of how mecha combat would look like in a 2D fighting game setting. Despite some small cracks here and there and a few character balance issues, Cyberboss is a pretty functional game. Not bad for something from the 90s. Why do I personally has some trouble adjusting to the game's mechanics, a mecha fan would most likely feel right at home. The community is always down to have more players, and as cool as it was for Capcom to release a collection of their old fighting games, it makes you wonder if they'll ever experiment with such fighters ever again, or they'll play it safe by having Street Fighter be their only fighting game with the future. Because if you ask me, their long list of fighters could do more than just collect dust. For my final score, I give the game a 7 out of 10. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, if you like this type of content, please be sure to subscribe for more. I also want to give a special shout out to Polar Bear for helping me with the technical aspects of Cyberbots. It was a huge help. Thank you all and have a good one.